Karen uh, just mentioned a, a lot of um, what has transpired over the past few years, but um, so I graduated here from 10 years ago with a body of work that really was exploring um, the intersection between disability and uh, animality. And um, through that visual work, really also I came out of this program with the seeds of a project that I really hoped would turn into a book. And that book um, came to be Beasts of Burden. Um, and that the, my thinking in that book was to really kind of challenge the ways in which disability movements and animal movements have been very much pitted against each other. Um, and also to think through the ways uh, that we can understand ableism as a sort of uh, expansive um, category or system of oppression that doesn't just impact disabled people or able-bodied people, but actually really um, uh, impacts the way that we think about uh, non-human life. Uh, and that's sort of the, the trajectory uh, or the, the opening that kind of led to this, to this work. I see them very much as um, very much related, that what I'm trying to do in this work is look at how disability shapes our understandings of the environment and shapes our relationships to the environment, particularly um, damaged um, environments. Um, so this work really grows out of conversations within feminist disability studies, uh, people like Allison Kafer, Mel Chen, Eli Clare, who've really been looking at um, uh, this intersection between disability and the non-human, but also um, feminist new material, feminist new materialist works such as um, uh, the work of Stacey Alamo and um, uh, Anna Singh and Donna Haraway and such. So those are sort of some of the conversations that I kind of see this work um, rooted in. So I want to just begin with uh, the above image. Um, it's a black and white aerial photograph of a somewhat industrial arid landscape. One's eyes are immediately drawn to three dark and large rectang rectangular shaped pools in the ground that take up a significant portion of the photo. At the bottom of the image is written figure 196, Hughes Aircraft Lagoon, Tucson, Arizona. And actually I just want to pause for a moment and say if anyone has any um, need to move or stretch, just please feel free to do that. And if I'm um, speaking too quickly, um, please let me know uh, for uh, access reasons. So the dark substance in the lagoon is a mixture of chemicals Hughes had been disposing of since 1952. Before ending up in the lagoon, the chemicals, mostly airplane part degreasers such as trichloroethylene or TCE, would be used in the manufacture and cleaning of missiles that would maim and kill people in North Korea during the Korean War. Over the three decades that these lagoons were used for waste disposal, the chemicals would at times overflow the lagoon, stressing and eventually killing the mesquite and cottonwood trees and other plant life in their wake. At the same time, more than 4,000 gallons of TCE slowly flowed downward through the less than 100 feet of porous earth entering Tucson's regional aquifer and altering the chemical makeup of the groundwater. The chemicals traveled northwesterly, entering the sand, gravel, and clay that made up the aquifer's geological matter. Moving with gravity towards the north flowing Santa Cruz River, moving towards the, with gravity towards the north flowing Santa Cruz River. However, before the contaminants could reach the surface and enter the above ground water, they reached the municipal and private wells where they were pulled up and distributed across Tucson's largely Mexican-American <coughs> south side and portions of the Tohono O'odham Nation. Residents began to notice their plants would die when they'd water them. Their dogs and cats and farmed animals began to become ill. The chemicals entered people's bodies as they drank or showered. Many people died of cancer, were diagnosed with chronic illnesses, or were born with disabilities. As alarm grew, Hughes spokespeople and the Pima County Health Department declared people were sick not because of pollution, but because they were, quote, genetically disadvantaged, suggesting that they were predisposed to illness. Health studies were conducted, and the same contaminants were given to thousands of mice to see what the toxic effects would be. When the contamination became undeniable, multi-million dollar treatment facilities were built to treat the groundwater. Community members, mostly women, 
fought for the Arizona Senate to approve $250,000 to establish the El Pueblo Health Clinic, which would offer community members health care for TCE-related um, concerns. While the funds were granted, numerous Republicans objected, citing the community's phantom illnesses. For more than half a century, the Hughes Aircraft Lagoon has produced dis disability in various ways, locally through contamination, internationally through Hughes' use of missiles, rhetorically through legal and political frames, and across species and environmental boundaries from humans to aquifers. I have laid out some of these various trails of harm and illness in order to identify what I am calling disabled ecologies. The webs of disability that are created spatially, temporally, and across species boundaries when ecosystems are contaminated, depleted, and profoundly altered. I understand disabled ecologies as the material and cultural ways disability is manifested and produced between and among human and non-human entities. While work within disability studies has long examined the ways in which the environment constitutes disability, centering disabled ecologies helps expose how disability in turn shapes the environment. It is this more than human aspect of what we might call Hughes Aircraft's disabled ecology that I will focus on during this talk, because Tucson's aquifer has in effect been rendered disabled by the contamination, a point that opens up generative possibilities for understanding how conceptions of disability constitute our understandings of environmental harm and the <coughs> relational networks that this harm is situated within. So in Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, Anna Singh, Elaine Gon, and their fellow editors suggest that for humans and non-humans alike, the condition of the Anthropocene could be articulated as suffering from the ills of another species. As they detail, climate change, pollution, and extinction are increasingly presenting as catastrophic changes to relational networks between living and non-living beings. This attention to relational harms and at times relational flourishing is an increasingly important thread within current environmental humanities and feminist new materialist work. My research reads such analysis as a call to disability studies to think with and respond to these environmental ills. I build off of this work while naming disability as an integral and urgent part of this relationality that is rarely, if ever, addressed. Utilizing Allison's, Allison Kafer's political relational model of disability, which understands disability as experience, quote, in and through relationships, my research follows, follows numerous scholars who are calling on us to stay with the trouble, as Donna Haraway does, or live in our messes, as Anna Singh does, to suggest that responding to our current regime of environmental devastation in part demands that we must learn to live in and with multi-species disability. So in order to do this, my research follows three distinct paths of analysis. The first is that I ground my work in, Hughes Air, in the Hughes Aircraft field site and the larger military capitalist regime it was a part of, as well in the, as in the particulars of Tucson's regional aquifer. The second is that I trace the ways Da environmental damage has been conceptualized by a broad range of scientists, policymakers, theorists, and activists through narratives of health and disability, focusing in this talk on how the word impaired has been taken up by the Environmental Protection Agency. I suggest that metaphors of health are arguably some of the most ubiquitous and impactful ways of talking about environmental harm, and I ask what critical disability perspectives can make of this. Finally, utilizing disability theory and feminist eco-criticism, I take seriously the possibility that narratives of environmental health are not mere metaphors, but rather should productively be viewed as moments of disability, or of what I'm calling ecological disablement, or the, the profound alterations to the capacities and functionings of an entity or system which limits its ability to sustain itself and others as it previously had, and which alters its reproductive capacities. So home of the saguaro cactus, the quintessential symbol of the Southwest, the city of Tucson sits in the Sonoran Desert, surrounded by mountains on all sides. As a region that has experienced nu numerous cycles of conquest and colonization, Tucson is today a, a city with strong Latinx and native roots, both a deeply multicultural city and one with strong divisions over, <coughs> sorry, over immigration policies and the role of borders. Located at the intersection of these complex racial, national, and colonial dynamics, 
The area has also dealt with the ecological consequences of being a growing desert city with limited regional water sources. Spurred on by the arrival of post-war technologies and the emergence of new high-tech industry resulting from the increasing presence of the US military after World War II, Tucson has witnessed not only a population boom, but numerous environmental crises as well, from severe water shortages to the dangerous effects of industrial pollution to the increasing impacts of climate change. So in 1951, Tucson became, of the, became home of the Hughes Missile Systems Company, which is now Raytheon, a major player in post-war US military industries. Hughes contracted out the newly built Air Force Plant 44, and within a year was, building, was manufacturing radar no noses for F-89 Scorpion fighter interceptor aircraft to be used against North Korea. In 1952, only a year after opening, the plant began disposing of large amounts of contaminants such as TCE, 1,4-dioxane, and chromium-6 into the lagoon, a massive pit with no liner. By the mid-1980s, the Tucson Water Department would be shutting down wells with more than 920 times the EPA's allowable levels of TCE. As the contamination spread underground into the aquifer and then into neighborhood wells, the TCE plume, as it eventually came to be known, reached out 10 square miles from south to north and a mile and a half east to west. While many of those living in the area had been there for generations, Many more had just relocated after one of the oldest and most vibrant Mexican-American neighborhoods in Tucson, La Calle, had been demolished in a racist downtown revitalization plan. In addition, the plume impacted native land that, Tohono, that the Tohono O'odham had long hoped to use for agricultural purposes. So a typical case of environmental racism and native dispossession through contamination, the impacts of the pollution on residents went unacknowledged for nearly 30 years even after the area became registered as a Superfund site in 1981. Instead, communities on the south side endured years of racist and classist accusations that their congenital disabilities and cancers were their own fault, again, for being genetically susceptible to illness, but also because of poor, quote, poor reproductive choices or a consequence of diet and lifestyle. As one reporter noted in the early 80s, Residents were told during meetings with city officials that they were getting sick, quote, because of the chilies and beans they ate. And the mostly women organizers were dismissed as, quote, hysterical, as hysterical Hispanic housewives. It was only through a mixture of fierce community organizing, local investigative reporting, and a major litigation against Hughes, the city of Tucson, and numerous other parties that it began to be acknowledged acknowledge that the alarming rates of cancers and congenital disabilities that, that the community was experiencing were caused by Air Force contaminated water. So before we go on any further, it is necessary to take, take you on a detour to introduce everyone to Tucson's aquifer, um, which as you will see, I've become completely obsessed with. Um, so because one of the many things that I have found compelling about aquifers is that people from all sorts of walks of life and educational backgrounds really don't really seem to know what they are. Um, are they a part of a city's infrastructure? Are they human made? Are they natural? Are they a mixture of the two? So the above image in, is, is in fact a study I made um, in the early days of this project of a series of, of hmm? oh, Slide. Thank you. <laughs> that would help. Thank you, Karen. Um, so this image, not the other one, is in fact a study I made in the early days of this project, um, part of a series that I'm making of speculative aquifers. So I began this aspect of the project in order to track my own changing perception of what an aquifer is, because I really didn't know what an aquifer was, and I wanted to be able to, to follow the ways in which I um, Learned, I learned about it and um, what, how I would imagine it differently. So this is just a very blocky and rough watercolor with lots of blues and grays, and the layout presents the aquifer as resembling a dam or something of some kind. So some sort of combination of industrial um, or, or human-made and, and natural um, environment. So introducing an aquifer is also a surprisingly challenging task, as unlike many other natural environments, Aquifers are rarely given names. So as hydrologist Fred Tillman, who worked for the United States Geological Survey, 
and who monitors the contamination at Air Force Plant 44, told me, quote, hydrologists are not the most poetic people, at least not in any lyrical sense. <laughs> and if there's any hydrologists in the room, that might not be true, but this was his take on hydrologists. So, um, an aquifer's namelessness is only part of the challenge. They are also not visible or navigable. Existing in the deep underworld below our own, we cannot see them or touch them. Tillman compared trying to visualize an aquifer to the study of outer space. We can piece together bits and pieces of information we can gather, but we must infer the rest. While aquifers are an essential part of human infrastructure across the world, they remain in many ways unknowable. So in reality, oh, as, sorry, as anthropologist Andrea Ballesteros' work on a Costa Rican aquifer suggests, this confusion is actually hardly accidental. If pressed to describe an aquifer, many typically imagine it as a sort of underground tank. Case in point, here's another slide of another early speculative aquifer, shows a dark cave-like opening that sits within an otherwise dirt-colored frame. So while not a tank, I clearly imagine the aquifer as a contained space. However, as Bellistero describes, the image of an aquifer as a container helps perpetuate the idea that it can be measured and analyzed to perfectly suit a community's infrastructural needs, while erasing its fundamental ent entanglements with other ecosystems, an idea that conveniently benefits those industries and investors that would wish to exploit it. So in reality, an aquifer is much more messy. So this watercolor is more sort of physiological and bodily with muted swirls and dabs of colors across the page. An aquifer is a complex network of porous and non-porous underground materials that are surrounded by and altered by water that can literally be thousands of years old and which is often moving wherever gravity is guiding it. More akin to a sponge, Here I have imagined a giant soggy sponge sitting within the Tucson Basin with mountains above and bedrock below painted in black. The water that makes up an aquifer occupies the available porous spaces between grains of sand, larger gravel, or impervious layers of rock and clay. But even, in this, example but even this example fails to represent most aquifers' lack of borders, their porousness, and their extraordinary connectedness with the world above. So in this aquifer, the sponge has been replaced with a network of colors and tendrils that move across the page, the same black above and below. An aquifer most often cannot be disentangled from other aquifers, or for that matter, from the above ground rivers, streams, and riparian ecosystems that it is connected to. Understanding aquifer, aquifers this way demands that we recognize them as more than infrastructure, instead seeing them as vital parts of the ecosystems that make up the landscapes that we are enmeshed in. So an aquifer's inaccessibility, and I of course use that word purposefully, is thus due in part to the fact that we cannot see, touch, or smell them, its material formations deep underground and out of our human sensorial reach. But it is also due to the ways that aquifers have come to be understood as worth thinking about only in terms of their water output. Aquifers are tellingly not covered by the 1972 Clean Water Act, for example, which in a typically anthropocentric move protects only navigable waters, bodies of waters that humans could ride a vessel upon. Indeed, the only federal environmental, lo environmental law that I have found that attends to aquifers is the Safe, Safe Drinking Water Act, but only in as much as it covers the groundwater people drink. The act does not mention aquifers, instead referring to groundwater wells, highlighting the infrastructural. Aquifers as natural environments or ecosystems remain mostly unprotected under federal laws. While aquifers cannot be seen, continual effort is made to represent them. Surveyors and scientists map and diagram them, diagram them, trying to render visible something that inherently is not visible. They do this in order uh, to understand everything from which way contamination will likely flow to where the best spot for a well might be. Often aquifers are rendered as simple textbook drawings like the one above. Mm -hmm. This image shows a layer of earth beneath us that is not saturated with water, the Vado stone. The porous layer that is saturated, saturated with water, the aquifer, followed by the impermeable layer or bedrock where water cannot pass through. 
And you can see a little simple illustration of a well that goes down um, into the porous rock area that's saturated with groundwater. Other representations are far, far more specific. This diagram, for instance, is labeled figure three, generalized geologic section of the upper Santa Cruz basin, and is specifically of the Hughes aircraft area. The scientific rendering maps the depth and length of the various geological structures in the basin and, and identifies different sediments through a variety of dots and lines. Another shows the geohydrology study area along section BB, which is also situated within this study site. The diagram maps the aquifer through visual interpretations of well drillings, again representing various sediments with different dots and lines. So this particular map is interesting, as in the legend that is included, it, there's a pattern for the parts of the aquifer that are inferred. However, the maps that are most commonly associated with Tucson's aquifer are maps like the one that will shortly be above. Are maps like this. Maps that show a contaminated plume of toxic chemicals that must be contained and managed. This TCE plume is usually displayed over an aerial map of South Tucson and is shaped like a feather or a gigantic sperm depending on where your imagination takes you. <laughs> The plume does not represent the shape of the aquifer, but rather represents where geohydrologists believe the contamination to be located. These maps also locate the facilities where the groundwater is brought in for treatment, a word that perhaps takes an additional meaning, takes on additional meaning, when one considers that in the language of ecological risk assessment, Tucson's groundwater is impaired. So impaired waters are defined by the EPA as, quote, the detrimental effect on the biological integrity of a water body caused by an impact that prevents attainment of the designated use. In the field of ecological risk assessment, the definition is broader. Ecosystems are impaired if their condition has departed from an acceptable state in a way that is ecologically or societally significant. According to the EPA, close to half the rivers and streams in the United States are impaired waters. However, this number does not include the one-thirds of lakes and ponds, the two-thirds of bays and estuaries that are also impaired. As these impaired waters are largely attended to by the Clean Water Act, these statistics additionally do not cover non-navigable waters, such as the nation's aquifers. So the word impaired is, of course, compelling to me, coming from disability studies, because of its foundational role in developing the field. The social model long ago framed impairment as being the material reality of differing embodiments, with disability being understood as the way impairment is turned into deficiency or obstacle as a consequence of the way that, of, that society is organized, socially, politically, and also environmentally. Perhaps because of this early division, impairment has largely been presented as more objective, more biological, and more scientific than disability. And yet, as Michael Ralph has outlined, Despite its perceived objectivity and roots in science, the medicalization of the word actually originates in changes to the U.S. life insurance industry that emerged after the abolition of slavery. Deploying a medicalized idea of impairment as a way of attending to different risks associated with freed slaves, impairment became a way of upholding racist hierarchies in defining which lives were conceived as less valuable. So such a history opens up questions of how and why the term impairment came to be used by scientists assessing ecological risk, itself a deeply racialized phenomena as environmental justice activists have long shown. So work such as Ralph's has challenged the traditional framings of, of impairment by examining the political and historical processes that have shaped the concept. Similarly, many critiques of the disability impairment divide have emerged over the years, which suggest that the social model fails to engage with how impairments themselves are socially constructed. Yet, impairment is still persistently used as a placeholder to name the more material and embodied aspects of disability, and is also routinely used to mark conditions in other contexts or other eras that may be culturally inaccurate or ahistorical to name as disability, but are recognized as being relevant to disability studies or akin to the experience of disability. 
Thus, the concept of impairment, while no longer being viewed as a pre-social biological fact, does remain elusive. Yet, as my research shows, it is this very flexibility that allows impairment to generatively point to new arenas of engagement for disability studies that may otherwise go unrecognized. So what are critical disability studies scholars and activists to make of impaired waters? Such language could easily be understood as yet another use of the kinds of ableist metaphors that disabled activists have long critiqued. Ones that could be, sit, be situated alongside phrases such as crippled economy or paralyzed by fear. Yet such a framing seems less useful when we consider that the word begins to make an appearance in environmental literature in the 1970s, the same decade that the environmental health movement was forming, a movement that centered the relational dynamics between harmed environments and harmed populations. The 70s also saw environmental sciences, scientists beginning to, take, to make a case for the scientific basis for what became known as ecosystem health. So in the 1990s, the usefulness of such metaphors was actually hotly debated. Scientists who promoted a frame of ecosystem health were beginning to map out the similarities between diagnostic challenges at the level of the individual and the whole ecosystem. Opponents, on the other hand, argued that health made little sense at a level of organization beyond the individual, an idea widely challenged by the concept of public health, of course, and that unlike individuals, ecosystems have no generalizable or normative optimum state. Interestingly, from a disability studies perspective, those who challenged these critiques often pointed out the social and cultural dimensions of health, explaining, as one piece put on the history put it, that, quote, definitions of health are constantly evolving and that social context strongly conditions what is considered to be healthy. While definitions of and approaches to ecosystem health are still hotly debated, Today, a variety of government agencies, scientists, and others work to address ecosystem health. So humanities scholars and environmental activists also de deploy the language of health to refer to environmental damage, invoking elaborate disability il and illness metaphors to make sense of contamination and depletion, or more ubiquitously in their script descriptions of ecosystems as damaged, maimed, scarred, ill, or dying, or increasingly when theorizing the Anthropocene as monsters or mutants. For instance, Anna Singh suggests we must become familiar with the art of living on a damaged planet, which in part means attending to the monsters that have been birthed from it. Bruno Latour points to the mutation of the atmosphere caused by climate change. Outside of academia, Bill McKibben has compared our permanently altered planet to a sick patient whose body is no longer working as it used to, while Naomi Klein has likened our current environmental crisis to reproductive disorders. While, ecolo while ecological metaphors of health are often traced back to conservationist Aldo Leopold, such a genealogy er erases indigenous epistemologies that have long understood the environment as kin or as an extension of one's body. Native scholars such as Leanne Simpson, Noelani Goodyear, Kaokua, and Winona Leduc, for instance, understand nature not as separate from human culture, but as family that can be maimed and made ill. For example, Simpson argues that native people must form relationships to their ancestral lands, regardless of whether these lands are protected national parks or densely polluted cities. Simpson asks how someone can be close to the land if it is so polluted that it poses a risk. Her answer is simple. If the river is too, pol is too polluted to swim in or eat from, you can still boat across it. She says, quote, you do not abandon your mother when she is sick. You do not abandon the land because it is contaminated or encroached upon. So what all of this shows is that a broad spectrum of scientists, policymakers, environmental humanities scholars, and indigenous communities on some level recognize landscape, the landscapes we inhabit as increasingly impaired. Thus, one of the interventions of this research is to point to an urgency of bringing this work into conversation with critical disability perspectives. I want to follow and build off of these various ways of thinking with ecological health as a material reality and take seriously the possibility that processes of ecosystem impairment, illness, and mutation are not mere metaphors, but rather could be generatively understood as part of the disability experience, or what I'm calling ecological disablement. 
So to explore what ecological disablement might mean, I'd like to return to Tucson's aquifer. My archival research reveals that the term impaired is repeatedly used in the documents from the 1970s that are concerned with the region's dwindling water resources. These references are to impaired groundwater, note, not aquifers, groundwater that has been overpumped. So the 1970s were a tumultuous time in Arizona's water policy as decades of exploiting the aquifer from cattle farming, agricultural use, and a growing population had drastically depleted Tucson's aquifer, which at the time was the sole source of drinking water for the area. Reliance on groundwater had also devastated traditional agricultural methods practiced in the area by the Tohono O'odham, whose ancestors had for centuries created complex irrigation systems that relied on rainwater harvesting through the use of the, of the region's many washes and floodplains. So one of the things that happens to an aquifer when its water table recedes is that it loses reach. Losing reach is a hydrological concept that identifies what happens when the water in an aquifer can no longer reach a stream, river, or water body on the land surface. As an aquifer's water is pumped away, plants and trees that, look, that grow along the riverbed become stressed and die. And there is, so in the Tucson Basin, for instance, has seen large die-offs along the Santa Cruz River in the past because of pumping, and there's evidence that before the aquifer was pumped away, that the Santa Cruz River much, used to flow much farther and for a much longer period than it does now. So photographs from the early 20th century actually show dense forests of mesquite trees and cottonwood trees that used to line the Santa Cruz. So after it was pumped, the vegetation became much sparser and the river much drier as the aquifer receded. So perhaps because I have a hard time reaching things myself with my own impaired arms, I am captivated by this image of aquifers, streams, and riparian ecosystems being unable to reach each other. So thus here, in yet another of my speculative aquifers, I have drawn dozens of caricatures of my disabled hands and arms growing from the aquifer, reaching out in a drastically unsuccessful effort to grasp the tree-lined riverbed. So thinking with the concept of losing reach, we can see how ecosystem impairment can overlap with various models of disability. When considering this social model, for instance, it may seem difficult to see how problems of depletion or contamination or extinction for that matter could be said to be caused by the way that society is organized, by social, political, and structural dynamics. Yet ecologists themselves have already pointed to the social and political aspects of ecological impairment. Returning to the definition of ecological impairment mentioned earlier may prove useful. So ecosystems are impaired if, quote, their condition has departed from an acceptable state in a way that is ecologically or societally significant. So the inclusion of phrases such as acceptable state and societal significance point to social organization. What social forces are at work in defining an acceptable state? What sorts of things are taken into consideration and what aren't? when defining what harmed ecosystems have societal significance. As we have seen when it comes to aquifers, an acceptable state has everything to do with them continuing to be of use to humans. So groundwater is impaired based not on whether it loses reach with other ecosystems, but on when its depletion poses a risk to human consumption needs. In fact, looking closely at how different ecosystems are defined as impaired, we can find again and again that like with legislation, legislative definitions of human disability in the US, the inability to work, to be able to labor and produce capital is essential for how and when ecosystems are defined as impaired. So all of this opens up a variety of questions. Which impaired landscapes are considered societally significant enough to be treated with multi-million dollar treatment facilities? which, due to various values, policies, and power inequalities, are not deemed societally significant and thus excluded from systems of care, and therefore at risk of further harm. So eco ecologist Glenn Sutter II, the author of the above definition of ecological impairment, um, argues that an impaired ecosystem needs different support systems than an unimpaired one. He writes, just as a paraplegic and a blind person need different assistance, an impaired ecosystem needs different management. 
Social and political dynamics are also at work in another kind of aquifer that has come to my attention throughout my, my research, sensitive aquifers. So I want to return to the photograph of the Hughes Aircraft Lagoon. The image was taken in 1979 as part of an aerial mission for an EPA-sponsored initiative called the Surface Impoundment Assessment, or SIA, project. So part of the 1974 Safe Drinking Water Act, the goal of the SIA was to locate and assess sources of potential groundwater contamination across the country. After weeks of searching early last year, I was able to find the contact information for one of the chief hydrologists who have worked on the SIA in the, in the late 1970s for Arizona. James Lemon was in his early 30s when the EPA's SIA inve investigation began and was working with the Arizona Department of Health Services, an agency that oversaw everything from public health to, the environmental, to environmental quality concerns, a situation that was common at the time before the creation of the EPA separated environmental issues from the broader public health issues. Lemon and another young hydrologist, James Engel, were assigned, to the job of uh, assigned the job of finding and documenting Arizona's groundwater contamination. In fact, Lemon was in the airplane when this photograph was taken, guiding the photographer to exactly where the impoundments at Hughes Aircrafts could be found. Lemon and Engel's work is in many ways what brought the TCE contamination to light. So Lemon generously agreed to, to, to uh, be interviewed by me and then even more generously actually offered to give me his entire archive of documents from this whole period of time when he was there. These documents have become one of the central sources of my investigation in part because they offer insights into the SIA investigation and other parts of the site's history that have really not been told, but also because of the ways that the archive narrates very various views on Tucson's aquifer. So these documents sometimes present the aquifer as akin to a bank, a valuable reserve that can be accessed when needed if managed well, but they also persistently <laughs> render the aquifer as a vulnerable body in need of treatment, specifically a sensitive body. So numerous documents consistently refer to the area's sensitive aquifers. At first I presumed that a sensitive aquifer must be an aquifer that is at risk of overdrafting. But as I learn, a sensitive aquifer is actually an aquifer that lies less than 100 feet below the surface, making it vulnerable to contamination. Hughes Toxic Lagoon sat on top on, of just such one aquifer area. So the word sensitive is surprisingly lively and certainly feminized. I imagine the geological formations, sediments, and ancient water that make up the aquifer as a sort of 19th century invalid, sensitive to its environment and to external influences. From the Latin senses to feel, the, world, the word's earliest uses reflect perception and feeling. To be sensitive is to be endowed with sensation. It was not until 1816 that it was first recorded as meaning easily affected. However, as Mel Chen has noted when reflecting upon living with multiple chemical sensitivities, the labeling of something as sensitive also reflects society's tendency to individualize social and environmental concerns. As Chen writes, the individuated property assignation of I am highly sensitive furthers the fiction of my dependence as against others' independence. The question then becomes which bodies can bear the, fi the fiction of independence and of uninterruptibility. Like the designation of the Southside community as genetically disadvantaged and predisposed to illness, the designation of Tucson's aquifer as sensitive lingui linguistically places the burden of responsibility on the aquifer versus on the exploitative regimes of militarization and extractivism that created the contamination. Considering the interruptibility and dependency of bodies and aquifers helps lead us back to relationality, to entanglements, and to the concept of disabled ecologies. Moving from the more diagnostic frame of impairment used by ecologists, towards what Allison Kafer would call a political relational model of disability, allows us to understand not only the interconnectedness of bodies and ecosystems, but also exposes the vulnerability of humans, species, and ecosystems to the same systems of injustice. In this case, the military and the racist, settler, colonialist, and anthropocentric systems and perspectives that allowed the South Side to be seen as a dumping ground. I have found throughout
about this research that the people who understand these entanglements the best are, of course, those who were impacted by the contamination on the south side. These community members have fought not only for safe water and compensation for the harm they and their community have experienced, but they have fought for the very health of Tucson's aquifer and the broader desert ecosystem. Southsiders are indeed some of the only people I have come across who deeply understand the aquifer and its entanglements. Many residents have worked literally for decades to make sure that it is being treated, even in cases when the clean water is simply pumped back into the aquifer versus being cleaned and served to the public. This is all the more striking when one considers that these same people have had loved ones die, have themselves become chronically ill from drinking the aquifer's water. While residents often do associate Tucson's water with death, the aquifer itself is treated with care and kinship. To return to Leanne Simpson's framing, Southsiders have continued to find ways of being close to the aquifer. So what would happen if politicized disabled communities began doing something similar? If we understood our ill and sick, monstrous and mutant, impaired and disabled landscapes as part of our expansive disability community, or if we saw our own human disability as an aspect of these larger human and non-human webs of disabled ecologies. By centering communities and ecosystems that have become, become disabled due to injustice, this research asks us to think through how and when we can recognize the importance of the aesthetic, political, and ontological possibilities of disability while also attending to the violence disability emerges from. Understanding dis damaged environments as disabled or impaired is certainly complicated, as it risks perpetuating the idea of disability as a negative, as something that should be cured, or as a problem to be solved. In another vein, it also risks relativizing environmental harm. One could imagine, for instance, corporate polluters co-opting the idea, just as they have conceptions of environmental re resiliency or adaptation. Yes, ecosystems are changing, becoming disabled, but what's wrong with that? Isn't disability a natural part of life? They will adapt and be resilient. Yet I believe disability studies and disability communities are uniquely positioned to be able to theorize the potential of bodies, species, and ecosystems to adapt, change, and be resilient without depoliticizing or relativizing such changes and the violence that brings them about. So following disability scholars such as Nirmala Aravelis, I argue that for, radical, for the radical potentials of disability to be fulfilled, critical disability perspectives must grapple with the injustices that cause disability human and non. Disability activists, scholars, and artists have long theorized to mean what it lived, what, have long theorized what it means to live with loss, limitation, vulnerability, interdependence, and adaptation. So what kinds of insights can this collective crypt knowledge offer to conversations about how to live with and respond to our current regime of environmental devastation? How can the ingenious ways of living that disabled people have for so long developed be put to use to help think through how to care for, respond to, and indeed create access for our increasingly impaired landscapes? So these are less questions that I want to address myself than conversations that I hope disability communities will take up.